You told me to skip school to go with you to the movies. You knew you were uncool, but you thought you could fool me. They play oldies in the afternoon for the elderly, and me and you, Fred and Ginger, black and white. I watch you watch it. It's a wonderful life. You call me cerebral. You never knew me like you thought you did. You never knew me like you thought you did, like you thought you did. That is a song called Brando by Lucy Dacus. We're about to talk about it because we're getting the band back together. Uh, for many years, uh, we would assemble periodically uh, the following people. Uh, Eric Danton, a reporter and critic, a former rock critic of the Hartford Current for 10 years, writes for many publications these days. Joan Holiday hosts the River Sound Cafe with Joan Holiday weekday afternoons on 93.9 and 101.5, The River, out of Northampton, Massachusetts. Wally Lamb is the author of nine books. His most recent novel is I'll Take You There. Uh, and so... We were just trying to figure out when uh, my producer, Jonathan McPants, and I were trying to figure out when we stopped. I think we might have stopped right around the Trump election. It was like we decided we couldn't have fun anymore. We had to concentrate on saving America, which, of course, we did. So that was good. So uh, welcome back, you guys. It's uh, it's great to have you all together on the air. So say say hello to the listeners. Hello hey, to the everybody. There you go. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. Uh, so, so what we do here is everybody brings in some songs that they've either discovered or recently fallen in love, fallen in love with, or just started hearing, uh, and we talk about them. It's as complicated as that. This was uh, one of Wally's. Uh, I think probably some to some degree or other, Lucy Dacus and the other members of Boy Genius, Julian Baker and Phoebe Ridges were kind of on everybody's ra- radar, on everybody's playlist here on the show, if I had to guess. But Wally, tell us a- about this song and why you chose it. Um, well, I'm a recent uh, discoverer of her. She, I guess she's only about 24, 25 years old. Um, I think uh, I've listened to enough of her stuff where she writes intelligent lyrics, but she's, uh, she's got a kind of a tough vulnerability going on there. <laughs> um, and I like the fact that she doesn't sound like um, a lot of other uh, young female troubadours. Um, I don't know. Uh, she, um, I guess I would call her an indie rocker, uh, maybe a little bit alternative. Uh, her subjects range from toxic love to queer love to old Hollywood, as you heard in that song, uh, religion sometimes. And um, this is not a quote from me, but from somebody else, uh, a rock critic, uh, who, who says she uses the personal as a portal to the universal. Um, I like that. I fell in love with her with a song called I Don't Want to Be Funny Anymore, which just is a great title anyway. But, earlier one, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I just quickly uh, talked to the other two here, Joan. I'm just assuming once again, uh, that particular trio, the three women who wound up kind of making a super group called Lowercase Boy Genius, there's th- there, you can't get away from them if you care about this kind of music, right? No, they're really great. And, you know, talking about Lucy Dacus's I Don't Want to Be Funny Anymore, kind of reminds me a little bit of the lyrics in that song Brando because she's talking about, you know, you called me cerebral, but you could have called me. (laughs) (laughs) And she talks about not wanting to be the funny girl anymore. She'd like to be, you know, typecast as something else for once, but she's great. I agree with you, Wally. And and Eric, I don't know, give us, say something uh, a rock critic ish for us about all this. (laughs) I really loved her 
previous album, which was her second called Historian that I think came out in 2017 or 2018. Um, the songs on that just really blew me away. Uh, and I have not gotten as into her latest, but maybe we'll add yet because there's still time. There certainly is still time. All right. I'm, well, I'm just going to button on to this one of the songs that I brought in today. Um, and, and just the only reason I'm doing it because because it does fit into the Boy Genius uh, orbit. Uh, it's by uh, a similarly young 25-ish uh, songwriter, I think, named Christian Lee Hudson. Uh, he has been sort of paired up uh, as a collaborator with Phoebe Bridgers. He may have done some work for Boy Genius. I know he did work on some of the other kind of group projects that she's done. Uh, but uh, this is uh, his own album. Uh, the song is called Northsiders. I was new in town, kind of goth I met you in the science quad You asked if I had any pot We're going up to Mikey's spot Covering important ground Tried cocaine at my cousin's house Yeah, I'm probably addicted now The things that children lie about It was getting late You offered me a place to stay We live up in the Palisades Tell your folks you ran away Besides you're a north sider now Nothing's going to change it pal. So, Joan, you and I tend to like the same songs. Uh, this has been a decades-long uh, tradition. Uh, and I think we both have the same problem, too, that like something like this song with this kind of a, a ascending note pattern will get in your head, uh, and like three hours later you realize you're still kind of running it through your brain. This is called, of course, an earworm. But I was interested in your reaction to this one. You know, it's funny. I'd never heard this song before. And it, it's quiet, and and... And interesting, the lyrics are, are sort of visceral and everyday. Uh, it just captured me. I really like it. Thanks for turning me on to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wally, how about you? Any reactions? Um, yeah, I wasn't really uh, focused when I just heard this on the, on the lyrics so much, but um, he, he sounds a bit like, um, maybe a little bit less stylized, but... Um, uh, he's for me. He was reminiscent of uh, Sufjan Stevens, uh, who is uh, was an artist I like. I th- I'm really interested in a lot of his work. Yeah, and so it's almost impossible to come up with a song Eric Danton doesn't know about, or an artist Eric Danton doesn't know about. But I think I kind of almost did it with this one, right? You definitely did. This was he was not someone that I was aware of previously. I'm not sure how I missed it as a fan of Phoebe Bridgers and Lucy Takis and uh, and those circles. Um, I hear the Sufjan that Wally mentions and also some Elliot Smith, but there's this mordant wit that he has that I think those other two don't necessarily. There's something funny to me about a 30-year-old musician who, who has this real air of nostalgia in his music, <laughs> um, but he has it, and it's really compelling. Um, all right, so we're going to uh, jump from there into one of uh, Eric's picks this of everything that anybody brought in here, this thing, I wish we could play the whole five minutes of it because it is a completely haunting thing that is I'm going to be very involved with for a long time. It's a song called Hard Drive by Cassandra Jenkins. I don't know. Anything you want to say to set it up, Eric? This song, she wrote it not about the pandemic, not about anything that any of us collectively have been going through over the past, I don't know, 16, 18 months at this point. But it fits so well that she might as well have written it about that. Right. So we had to, um, to to get to the part that Eric likes the most, we kind of had to, or in fact, our producer had to kind of chop it into the middle. So I don't know. I would really, really recommend that people listen to this song from the beginning. It's Hard Drive by Cassandra Jenkins, but let's hear uh, some of it right now anyway. I ran into Perry at Lola's place. Her gemstone eyes caught my gaze. She said, oh dear, I can see you've had a rough few months. This year, it's going to be a good one. I'll count to three and tap your shoulder. We're going to put your heart back together. So all those little pieces they took from you, they're coming back now. 
they'll miss them too. So close your eyes. I'll count to three. Take a deep breath. Count with me. So Eric, I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. It's hard to be original in this day and age, but this thing seems really, really original to me. I agree with you. Um, it reminded me a little bit of Laurie Anderson, just the the tonal quality of her voice and the way she mixes singing with talking, and uh, some of the sort of what struck me as very New York touches, the the sort of meandering jazzy saxophone. But I don't know that I have ever heard a song quite like it really and every time i listen to it when she gets to the counting i find that tears just spring to my eyes it's it's something about the tone of her voice and the counting and that quiet optimism that is there really affects me every time i mean wally there's kind of a melancholy that runs through a lot of the songs that came in this time uh even even the person who used to host the happy club uh has uh, at least one song that's uh, a little bit melancholy. I think that's kind of no surprise. But this one, yeah, I, I don't know. There's uh, there's a way in which she's telling us some kind of really strange secret. And about getting her life back after a period of trauma. For, for background, <coughs> um, she's been around for a little while. She's released an album previous to her most recent, and she released an EP in 2013. So she's been around. She was supposed to tour as part of Purple Mountains, which was the band that David Berman had put together. He took his own life a few days before they were supposed to go out on tour and left the musicians who were supposed to go out with him with nothing to do. And part of this song, I think, is about that and and her sort of trying to get past the trauma of, of living through that. Um, but like I said, it coming out in, in February of this year, it really speaks to a much broader collective cultural moment. Yeah, I think if you listen from the beginning to the Laurie Anderson, I, now that you say that, I've been struggling the whole time thinking, what does this sound like? And it sounds like something, but it also doesn't really sound like anything that I've ever heard before that really kind of got to me. I don't know, uh, Joni, did you have any time to listen to this at all? Yes. Uh, Eric actually introduced me to this song a month or two ago. And we do, we talk about music on my show. If you I agree with you, Colin. If you listen to one song in its entirety from this show, it should be this one. This woman touches your soul with this song and she gives you healing. And I I cry when I hear it too. Um, it's an incredibly powerful song and I love it very much. And, and how about you, Wally? Um, I think I, this is the kind of uh, artist and song that... I would begin to love by about the third listening. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able to pick up much of a vibe on it um, this time around, but um, I'm a big Laurie Anderson fan from way back. So um, that sells me right there. <laughs> so we're going to kind of roll into the break with one of uh, uh, Joan's uh, picks. Uh, this is by a uh, somebody that you 
probably know, um, but uh, I'm, I'm particularly if you watch the Stephen Colbert show uh, because he's the band leader there. Uh, but um, kind of set this up for us, uh, Joan. Tell us a, a little bit about this and particularly why you picked I Need You by John Batiste. Well, John Batiste is just a musical genius, and he's got a personality as big as the continental United States. And this song is just pure fun energy and it's going to make you want to get up and dance. Um, and, and I would assume, like, Wally, I know your taste pretty well uh, and they sort of include New Orleans and stuff like that. I assume John Batiste is well positioned on your radar screen. Oh yeah, very much so. In fact, um, uh, I, I make, uh, a, you know, as a, uh, as a septenarian teenager, um, I still make up my play, my best of the year playlist, and uh, and this song was was on it. I, I I like him. I like the song a lot, um, and I was glad that he that he won those awards, the the Golden Globe, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, he's uh, he's had a good year, um, yeah. uh, even cinematically with with Soul, right? So uh, yeah, Eric, any, anything else to add before we we roll into it? I don't know his music as well as I probably should. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him at the Green River Festival uh, up in Greenfield, Massachusetts later this summer. So I uh, I will be more versed soon. All right. Here we go. I Need You by John Batiste. All right, so uh, we are back. Um, we are here with the Music Mavens. Uh, we're going to roll right into one of their choices. Uh, this is one of Wally Lamb's choices. The Music Mavens, by the way, if you're just tuning in, are Eric Danton, a reporter and a music critic. Joan Holiday, who hosts the River Sound Cafe with Joan Holiday, appropriately, uh, on 93.9 and 101.5 The River in Northampton, Massachusetts. And Wally Lamb, author of nine books. His most recent novel is I'll Take You There. So this is a song called Pigeons. Uh, by Bill Callahan, and we will talk about it on the other side. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Well, the pigeons ate the wedding rice and exploded somewhere over San Antonio. up the newlyweds and asked them where they wanted to go They said we don't care, we don't know anywhere Just go Ever since I'd gotten married I started working weddings Driving this long white limo Had their ceremony in Brackettville at that phony Alamo. We were 30 miles from the border. So, uh, this is, uh, as I say, a song by Bill Callahan. Uh, it's called Pigeons. Um, uh, it is uh, from, uh, I think, his most recent album. According to Jonathan McPants, nine of the ten tracks on this album have been released as singles. I mean, big means to bring, raise the question of what a single actually is at this point. But um, so, Wally, tell us about this song and why you picked it. Well, um, uh, I've uh, I discovered Bill Callahan uh, maybe three or four uh, CDs ago. Um, 
Uh, I like his lo-fi style. Um, I guess you could classify him as underground. Um, I am. Uh, we've had we've had a number of examples today uh, from the stuff we've heard and the stuff we haven't heard yet, uh, where uh, songs are half spoken as well as sung. Um, I, I guess probably what draws me to uh, Callahan is his um, his wry and kind of humorous lyrics. Um, uh, they they and they they tend, as this song does, to start out with the playful and move to the profound. Um, uh, I admire that. Uh, he is, um, I think, in some ways, uh, he could be a fiction writer because he assumes these uh, personae and becomes a character and does these interior monologues uh, in their voice and. Um, he uh, he sometimes follows that through uh, a whole album uh, where he is that character uh, on different on different songs. I think I he know, actually I just think he's, he's different. I yeah. like him. I think he might have actually written one book. But you hear that, Bill Callahan? Wally Lamb just said you could be a fiction writer. So I mean, <laughs> if that doesn't get you going. I, I don't know what would. So Joan, you know, I th- I think it's rare that I would say that. In- in terms of composition, so-and-so sounds a little bit like Tom Waits. But I think it's sort of the off-key mariachi horns and uh, the, all the kind of stuff that's going on in the background uh, uh, of this melody that makes me think a little bit about Tom Waits. I, I was interested in your reaction, though. I absolutely agree with that. And I think he's a storyteller in the same way that John or that Tom Waits is. And I also love his way with words The the, the rhyming of just go, limo, alamo, that's mm-hmm. pretty hilarious. And uh, I'm really interested, since Wally introduced him, uh, to check out some of his other songs and 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 hear the stories he has to tell. Um, I made the mistake, possibly, Erica, of looking up more uh, information about him. He actually, some of his childhood was in England, apparently because his parents were language analysts for the NSA, the National Security Agency. So it's no wonder he has all these dark secrets. Yeah, I didn't know that, actually. Um, He is another one who's had a long and varied career. He released his first 14 albums uh, under the name Smog. Um, And it was still basically just Bill Callahan, but he called himself Smog up until 2005 or 7 or something like that. Uh, On this particular song, the way that he drew out and divided the word San Antonio... When he, when he got to the word limo, I kept waiting for him to say zine after the musical break, and he didn't do it. <laughs> My brain totally got hung up on the fact that he didn't say limousine, he just said limo. So, yeah, I think we all, all like this song, and it does fit a little bit into the melancholy uh, sound of uh, of the pandemic, either in, you know, either three quarters done or, or not. Um, it's got a bit of, let's go to Lukenbach, Texas with Waylon and Willie and the boys in there. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I mentioned the Happy Club before. Uh, Joan Holiday for many years hosted the Happy Club, one of my favorite radio shows of all time, and one of the best titles for a radio show ever. So, you know, when Joan shows up with that, bearing that burden on her back, we're always a little surprised if, you know, anything comes out that's a little dark. Uh, but in fact, <laughs> she's gonna. You're, we're going to take you in a somewhat dark direction with a song called Jazz on the Audubon by the Felice, Felice or Felice, I'm not even sure, brothers. Uh, Joan, did you want to set this up a little? Well, the Felice brothers are a really interesting band. They're great live. And Ian Felice is their main songwriter. And he's a poet. And he's also a great storyteller. Uh, He can be really depressing. His brother James is kind of the happy guy of the band. He's his half brother, actually. But he's the other Felice brother. And he's the guy they send out to meet everybody when it's time for the band to make nice with people. But... uh, (laughs) I find this song to be a real evolution for the Felice brothers. It, I think this really elevated their already great songwriting. I, I'm almost thinking every band should have somebody like that. You know, it's like you go talk to Eric Dan, you give the interview. Uh, and it's like, well, no, I didn't write any of the songs. It doesn't make any difference. You make a good case for us. Uh, all right. So let's hear Jazz on the Audubon. The sheriff disappeared. Spitting out the seeds, feeling happy to be alone, but still turning a saxophone is cold as stone, kind of like. She said, This is what the apocalypse will look like. Human heart 
apocalypse will sound like But it'll be loud as a mushroom cloud It'll sound like Final Jeopardy But somehow be ghostly like a glockenspiel Like the testing of bombs or the tapping of stiletto heels It'll sound like jazz so, you know, Wally, you were saying before that there's a bunch of songs here that involve kind of uh, spoken plus sung or spoken, spoken as an alternative to, to singing. This is yet another one of them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. And I, I think it gives him the opportunity to get some of the poetry here across. Uh, I mean, Eric, I often find that when people sing, um, you know, it's a little bit harder to hear them that the instrument instrumentation is up behind them. You got to, you know, get out the the lyrics on, on the internet or something. What are the nice? One of the advantages of speaking something that has a lot of interesting language in it is people are more likely to hear it on the first or second go. It, yeah, and when you approach a song that way, then the technical decisions follow that. So they'll mix his voice higher up. That that is, it's it's easier to hear his voice because they put it higher up in the, the blend of, of instruments and, and vocals, so you can hear it. And that's good because this is another one where there's, you know, this is a bleak song, but it's also a funny song. Mm-hmm. You know, this is another darkly comic tune where, you know, the apocalypse will sound like Final Jeopardy and there's somebody in the car eating melon and spitting the seeds out. There's a lot of funny imagery in this song, despite the fact that, you know, it's uh, anything but cheerful, ultimately. Yeah, well, I wanted to, yeah go ahead, Joan. Go ahead. Up in the first line with that phrase doomed Corvette. How visual and perfect is that for the whole song? It just sets the thing up. Yeah. So, you know, Eric, because you kind of followed the industry too, I mean, there's so many things that are different these days. One thing about the Felice Brothers that's interesting about this album, and I, don't, I assume it is true across all streaming platforms, you can only stream three songs from this album, and the rest of them uh, are, are walled off somehow, um, which is maybe not a terrible idea for uh, somebody who was concerned about, you know, I mean, so much streaming that goes on that, as an alternative to actually paying for the music in, in some other way. There's another um, release that, Eric, it's one of your releases we're going to get to in just a, a little while that's only available for streaming for a, for 99 days, and then it just disappears. And I, I, it does seem like a lot of these acts are trying to think, okay, what can we do in this environment other than essentially give our music away? Yeah, um, the platform Bandcamp is one where oftentimes there will be a song or two available for streaming, and then after that you have to buy the record yeah. if you want to hear the whole thing, which I think is good because it you know you could always go to a different platform uh, and hear it that way, but it incentivizes you to support the musician even with your eight or nine bucks, which is what most albums seem to cost on Bandcamp. In the Felice Brothers case specifically, I think this full album isn't out until September, and so this was one of the early tracks that they released. So the other ones may be available to stream as they get closer. Sometimes it's it's like the single release strategy. You make another song available to stream on Bandcamp. So soon there will be four. Right. And then maybe there will be five or maybe not. They'll just keep it that way until the album comes out. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I listen on the Tidal platform because I'm very worried that the Carter family – uh, you know, has enough of my money. Um, and uh, um, that's what the, it's all blocked off and they don't really explain it. So but that would make some sense that maybe eventually more of it will be available. Um, all uh, right, Joan, whatever, whatever uh, this is worth. Um, I do my music shopping on Fridays and I go to places like Bandcamp and, uh, you know, uh, and the like. And um, I bought this uh, very same song uh, about three, four weeks ago. I, okay. I really like it. Yeah, it's great. Joan thanks you and the Felice Brothers thank you uh, as well. And also, did anybody observe that uh, the Felice Brothers rhymes with the Pernice Brothers, uh, another uh, another brothers group? That's been a source of some confusion, I found, actually. Oh, really? (laughs) All right, so let's uh, move along here. This is, we're going to move to one of Eric's selections. Uh, This is um, Waxahachi. This is sort of by three different artists working together uh, collaboratively. But I think you can probably explain this way better than I can. Yeah, um, the the primary artist and the one who sings it is Miranda Lambert, who is a, a fairly big country star. And I always thought of her as one of those pop country people. To the extent that I thought about her at all, it was that she had the misfortune to be married for a while to Blake Shelton. Um, but <laughs> when this album came 
over it was it was billed to me as you know it's it's stripped down tunes they recorded them with you know two guitars and a microphone in the desert outside marfa texas and i thought well all right that sounds good and when you strip away all the pop production and all the studio sheen you're left with a woman who has a really terrific voice incredibly expressive and that stripped down guitars and vocals thing really works for me and on some of the tracks on this record that they put out you can hear the wind blowing you know i think there's one where you can hear a coyote off in the distance it's very uh very on natural and this particular song really connected with me it's got all the stuff that i really like you know it's there's a, it's a road song it's a song about regret it's a song about yearning it's a song about hoped for but not guaranteed redemption it just all comes together in, you know, a three minute, basically folk country song rendered as simply as possible. Right. I would just like to point out that Casey Musgraves used to be married to Rustin Kelly, which is even harder, I think, to do. Uh, I mean, he <laughs> writes entire songs about what a terrible husband he, he was. Um, all right. So and also, I believe the Coyote was attending a conference at Marfa uh, and just happened to be there and agreed to uh, uh, to help out by howling. Uh, let's hear the song. So Wally Lamb, uh, to whatever degree I had a mental image of Miranda Lambert, it was a much more high gloss image th- of this. I was kind of, I don't know about you, but I was, Wally, I was kind of knocked out by the stripped down production of all this. Yeah, uh, it seems way more authentic uh, to me. I've been, uh, I've been listening to Waxahachie and I didn't even know that uh, she was part of it. Um, uh, sorry, Eric. I, uh, I, I know that my, <laughs> you know, my musical ignorance is really uh, probably... Um, Know, uh, making you recoil. Um, no, no, I, there may be, uh, this is confusing though, because there's the band Waxahachie, which is, uh, I've just forgotten her name, but that's a, that's a separate project. Oh, okay. And See, this song I'm is Waxahachie, which is a small town in Texas. And okay. so she's right. singing about the town Waxahachie, but the band Waxahachie is a whole different thing. So okay. it's not you. Yes. Glad to have that clarified. Can I just um, insert one little anecdote about Miranda Lambert? Um, my brother-in-law uh, went into, uh, on route, he was on Route 2, heading toward the casino, um, and uh, he went into a convenience store called Lumax, and lo and behold, uh, in the same store were Miranda Lambert and Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, I believe that they were probably coming back from Taylor's uh, Block Island uh, place, and uh, and he recognized them, and uh and Miranda Lambert just put her finger to her lips as if to say, Shh, don't blow our cover. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, uh, Taylor Swift has a house in Watch Hill, I think. Yeah, yeah she does. Yeah, she, does. she I believe she sold it, uh, but yes. Oh. Um, the, uh, the only reason I know this is one of my best friends from college has the house next door. Um, oh. And they actually sort of rerouted part of the sidewalk in Watch Hill because people were walking too close to Taylor Swift's house. 
Um, so uh, we're going to go out of this uh, segment. I, I, I'll just talk into it uh, just in the interest of time because I want to get to everybody else's songs. But, you know, we could do a whole show on how we get and consume and find music. And I think all four of us would have different techniques. But typically what I do, I, I do use the service title and I'll sort of go through and I'll have something kind of interests me. I'll throw it onto a playlist and then, you know, I'll be playing those playlists that might have 50 songs on them over and over again, maybe while I'm reading or about to fall asleep or something. And you know, for the last four years, I would say, three or four years, there is one artist who just every time something of hers comes on that I have just haphazardly or almost thoughtlessly thrown under the playlist, my head snaps to attention and I go, wow, wait, who's that? It's Oh, it's her again. It's her. Of course it's her. So uh, her name, uh, and it's a fairly familiar one, particularly if you used to listen to Live From Here or something like that, is Eva O'Donovan. Uh, she's uh, an amazing singer. She's also part of I'm With Her, another women's supergroup. Uh, and and um, just as a writer and a singer and everything else, uh, she just, for some reason or other, always, always commands my attention. So this is a slightly older song of hers, but I think it's a really good on-ramp. Right now, she's just dropping EPs right and left uh, in 2021. But this is an earlier cut. It's called King of All Birds. Look out, look out, here I come now, this All right, we are back. Uh, time for me to say thank you to our technical producer, Kat Pastor. A show like this in particular uh, requires uh, her to be on her game, which she always is. Jonathan McPants has inherited the role of producing these shows from Kyone Wolf, who used to do them, thanks to him as well. With us, Eric Denton, Joan Holiday, Wally Lamb, uh, all here as music mavens. Uh, we're running through some of their uh, recent discoveries. We're going to go to one of Eric's right now. Um, this is Salt. And so, Eric, maybe before we get into it, this is the most enigmatic thing that's on the menu today. We don't even know who these people are, and this is the one that's only available for 99 days, right? That's right, yeah. And it's their third album in about the past 12 or 14 months. They put out two last year, both of which were, were excellent. Um, they were both untitled with uh, parenthetical subtitles. And then this is the follow-up to that. It's called Nine. Uh, the album and the, and the song is Trap Life and they're English. We do know that much about them. Um, they've collaborated some with Michael uh, Kiwanuka um, and a few other people who are known in Britain more so than they are here. But it's this combination of gritty lyricism and almost an old school funky, uh, funky old school sound. It's, it's fascinating to me. It's it's this window into a world that I, I feel like I don't know that very much about, and they're showing me around. Yeah, I and I think the whole album is kind of worth exploring, too. There's sort of a lot going on on it from what I could hear in my quick visit today. But let's hear this particular cut.
So this song takes several other sonic turns as it goes along here. We just don't have time to get to all of them. I would say my own thought, uh, Joan, is, you know, I would come up to visit you, stop at Nita, and get some gummies. And I think this uh, album right away is going to start to make a heck of a lot more sense to me. They sound like musical cousins to uh, Tune Yards to me. Yes, I had the same thought. Same thought. Yeah, a, a little bit of that. And I'm always looking for something that kind of gets us back to the the party sound of Kid Creole and the Coconuts. And there are little parts of this song in particular where it almost sounds a little bit uh, like that. So, uh, Wally, I don't know, did you have any uh, chance to spend any time with this particular cut? Uh, no, but I want to go back to it because uh, I had fun listening to it. And... Um... Yeah, uh, Joan, that's a good observation about tune yards. I hadn't thought of them, but uh, uh, yeah, I can see that. And I, that's a, you know, that's a group that I really like too. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll definitely investigate this group if I can find them. Right, Eric? Well, they're on Bandcamp and they're also on Spotify, so you you'll be able to find them for at least a little while. Right. All right. Great. Yep. Uh, I can verify that they're on title as well. I think the key is to get Bill Callahan's parents to investigate them. They were with the National Secur- <laughs> Security Agency. They can find out who, who these people are. It might turn out to be, idea. it's probably Seal and a couple of other people. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll know all these people uh, when, when it comes out. So um, this is the shortest cut <laughs> by far that anybody brought in. Wally, this is one of yours. It's Sometimes by Bessie Jones and Group. It's also the oldest cut by far that anybody brought in. Well, set this up a little bit so people know what they're listening to. Well, uh, for a show that's supposed to be about new music, um, uh, it was. Uh, I'm not sure if this was allowed. I broke the rules by uh, including somebody who was born in 1902 and died in 1984. But um, she's new to me, uh, new this past year. Um, she was a discovery, I guess you could say, uh, by uh, Alan Lomax, the uh, the folk music anthropologist who um, trekked around the country um, with his uh, with his tape recorder, uh, recording field uh, records, and um, uh, very interesting history. Her grandfather was a slave, uh, captured and brought here uh, to the U.S. along with his five brothers, um, and um, Bessie Jones uh, took it upon herself to be an educator of um, uh, African American slavery, and um, so she um, she was as much a t- as a, she was as much a teacher as uh, as she was a musician. Uh, married and a mother at age twelve, kind of a hard scrabble life. Um, I discovered her uh, when they came out with a retrospective sixty song collection um, uh, called. Get in Union, which I believe came out last year. A lot of a lot of her stuff is a cappella, and she's backed up by the Georgia Sea Island Singers. Hmm. Um, she is a Georgia native, I believe. So uh, it makes me think of that series High on the Hog about food, and I think the Sea Islands might be uh, part of that. All right, let's hear uh, something uh, from Bessie Jones and Group. Uh, it's called Sometimes. Wait. Sometimes, better know the law. Sometimes, go from marriage. Sometimes, it is mother law. Sometimes, let's get on board. Sometimes, I want to ball that jack. Sometimes, I tell my honey, come back. Sometimes, I want to rap that jack. Sometimes, I get a hump in my back. Sometimes, I'm going over here. Sometimes, I'm going to get my pal. Sometimes, way down yonder. Sometimes, better lose the law. Sometimes we we'll from Mary, sometimes it is mother-in-law, sometimes let's get on board, sometimes we're going to bowl that day. Okay, we're going to do a quick segue, Kat, get ready to go to number 10, because in fact, yes, this is an old song, but we can uh, freshen it up a little bit, so to speak, because I believe in 1999, um, Moby uh, used it in this particular cut. Which, come to think of it, who's to say Moby isn't in that group Salt, too? He could be. So, um, and, and, and Joan, you know, there's sort of a way in which, uh, you know, 
you, you listen to something like that and you think, wow, this is, you know, the description Wally just gave is so powerful and historic. Should Moby be doing something like that? But I don't know. Moby can get away with that stuff, I think, because it's hard, hard is in the right place. Um, you know, I'm a white woman and it's hard for me to make those kinds of judgments. Mm-hmm. True, I would true. Speak to a person of color. <laughs> true. Um, and, and I mean, Eric, I do think it's, I'm glad that Wally picked this out because I think, you know, we're kind of going through a little period uh, of reassessment and remembering and noticing some things that didn't get noticed enough the first time around. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if more and more things like this kind of creep into the popular consciousness where they belonged in the first place. Yeah, they should creep into the popular consciousness. Songs like this, and this is not one that I had known before. Well, I, I you know, I probably heard that Moby sample of it because that was everywhere in 1999. <laughs> but th- this is songs like this, this one, and songs like it are so foundational to so much that came after, from you know the blues and gospel of the immediate post-war years to rock and roll to to the soul and funk and everything. This is what set all of that up. And so the more we pay attention to the stuff that came before, I think the better for our understanding of, of where things are now and how they got there. And really it's about giving credit to where it's due. Mm. And, you know, well, so, I, I well, also, you know, as an appreciator of things myself, I kind of like seeing musicians, no matter who they are, appreciating really good work that has been missed. Yep, absolutely. So, Joan, you're going to land the plane here today. Uh, You've got about 15 seconds to set up Shay's Lounge by Wet Legs so we can play a bunch of it here at the end. Oh, my God. This song is super fun. It is my personal song of the summer. It's like French pop meets light punk, and it's got this great dry British humor, and it even quotes Mean Girl. (laughs) <laughs> and the video is incredible. It's two young women from the Isle of Wight, and they're called Wet Leg, and it's Shays Long. All right. Uh, thanks to Wally, Eric, uh, and Joan, and here we go. All day long on the Shays Long, on the Shays Long, on the Shays Long, on the Shays Long, all day long on the Shays Long, on the Shays Long, on the Shays Long, on the Shays Long, all day long on the Shays Long. 